Your show is scheduled to start in 47 seconds. Hello, everybody. Welcome into a Monday edition. It appears that the host has already dialed into this show. Only one host is allowed per show. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties, and uh, hopefully uh, we can get them resolved. So uh, we're going to try it again. And um, so let's see what happens here. Your show is scheduled to start in 12 seconds. It appears that the host has already uh, dialed into this show. Only one host is allowed per show. I don't know what to do at this point, so we're just going to have to... Uh... Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And, uh, well, we're uh, again, it's Monday, and already we have some technical difficulties. And uh, evidently our network is having technical difficulties. So, uh, And uh, I'm not sure exactly what we can do, uh, so we're just going to... Uh, kind of a uh, just do our. We should probably just continue on as normal, and hopefully, uh, within the next ten or so minutes, the network comes back online and lets us uh, continue. But of course, if you are hearing this, we are still broadcasting to Google Hangouts and and uh, and all that good stuff. So it's just unfortunately, Blog Talk Radio and all of and everywhere that that gets redistributed to. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's, it seems weird to say this, but you won't be able to hear this. So yeah. Uh, they're having problems at the network, and so I am not sure exactly uh, what we can do. Uh, uh, it seems that we can't. I can't even disconnect from the network. It thinks that we're connected and we're not. So uh, <laughs> um, it's very, very, very strange. But uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll uh, try to do what we can. In the meantime, it is a Monday edition of the Computer America program, and uh, we've got uh, uh, we're going to do computer and technology news. That's brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America, and uh, we're going to uh, and we're going to be doing this uh, shortly for you. And uh, again, I'm just going to continue uh, to try to get into the network because uh, um, we can't. No, it just won't let me back in. It is they're definitely having some problems. So uh, normally when I would drop the signal, uh, we can get in and it would come up, but uh, it is uh, it is just uh, uh, and uh, just locked in. I can I'll try it again, but I don't I don't see what happens if we can get in. And um, all right, well it's uh, it, it, we're connected, but I don't know if we are connected. So we'll it will either we'll get the message or we won't. So let's uh, continue on. So anyway, it is a. Uh, Monday edition of the Computer America program, and we are uh, in the first hour. We're going to do computer and technology news, brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. And in the second hour, we're going to have the CEO of Dictionary.com going to be joining us here on the uh, program. So that uh, uh, we're going to. Start, I don't know if any of you use Dictionary.com. Uh, have, have they, you? they they have a pretty good. Um, oh, how do you say it? Whenever you look up the definition of a word, it either pulls it from dictionary.com. I know Google is trying to outdo them, but usually it's the first or second result whenever you do look up a word. And they are, you know, it, it, it's fitting that dictionary.com got the, the, the domain name for dictionary because they provide everything a dictionary would. Uh, you know, if you ever need to know anything about a word, they got you covered. And I guess they're here to talk about their new mobile app that, of course, is coming around just in time for the kids to go back to the classroom. Yeah. So they'll be on in the second hour to, to discuss that. Okay, and and not only that, they, they talk about interesting things like, uh, you know, the etymology of a word, you know, where a word That they do, that they do. Yeah, and uh, one of them they have, they're, they're, they're posing right now is, um, is uh, um, 
look at that. <laughs> Even when I try to go to a different browser, it thinks that we're connected. This is very strange. Um, uh, one of the things that gives you, like for example, uh, a word like, they ask the question, is irregardless a word? And how many times, I used to think that irregardless was not a word, it was in, improperly spoken. But according to uh, dictionary.com, um, it's not. It is an actual word, and it is in the Eng and it is in the dictionary, and uh, and can be properly used. See, that's the nice thing about languages. I don't think a lot of people realize this. Where they they learn something in in school, they learn it in eighth grade, and then they hold that to the rest of their life. And language is a pretty fluid, pretty dynamic uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And so, as people use it in pop culture and everyday speech and everyday language, I mean, uh, sneaked, you know, the the uh, the past sense of of sneak, the snuck, yeah, it, it uh, snuck. What was never a word, but you know, sneaked kind of fell out of favor in favor of snuck, and now snuck is a word. It, it's uh, as people use the English language and it develops and kind of you get little pockets where certain words are used in certain ways, even uh, pronunciations. Craig tried to call me on the way I say uh, coupon or uh, yeah, yeah, coupon. And, and of course, Craig. Coupon. Coupon. <laughs> so, of course, you go look it up and it, you can pronounce it both ways. So it doesn't matter what you learned back in grade school. It doesn't matter what you knew 10 years ago. It's a language is a fluid thing, and dictionary.com has a good way of showing you all that kind of stuff, what's proper, what's not proper, and it's a moving target. So don't 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 hold on to language like you know everything because it changes all the time. Yes, it does. And uh, uh, and we're going to have the company CEO uh, Liz uh, McMillan is going to be here on the program in that hour. So uh, in the meantime, if uh, you have a comment or question, uh, normally I would give out the phone numbers, but I don't think it's going to be relevant at this point because uh, nothing seems to be working. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and uh, do our computer news and, uh, and take it uh, as far as it goes, and hopefully Blog Talk Radio will uh, come back on. But let's, uh, let's do our, our news right now, okay? Tonight's computer and technology news is brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. You can visit them at slimwareutilities.com to clean, speed up, and optimize your Windows system. That's slimwareutilities.com. And uh, why don't you take the first story? Sure, I'll do the first story. Uh, the first one that I have, let's pop up. By the way, if there's a video portion, you should definitely check that out because I guess currently that is the only way that uh, you can hear us uh, tonight. But regard, uh, irregardless, <laughs> uh, the first story tonight, the first story tonight, uh, we're going to do this one from GeekWire, although it's been all over the news lately. It, To put it bluntly, Amazon, for once, has been getting a lot of bad publicity. Really? And you wouldn't think it was possible because we talk about them so much with drones. We talk about them and their marvelous two-day shipping. We talk about them and their video that rivals Netflix. They do a lot of things right. But as and, – and heck, we just talked about the other day how they were the world's largest company. They overtook Walmart. And, of course, that's all well and good. But lo and behold, in the past couple of days, they've been getting a lot of bad uh, press – due to the fact that uh, working conditions in Amazon, especially the warehouse division, mm -hmm. although I have heard horror stories of other parts of the company, uh, they are from, they're, they're stories of the people who actually went there and worked, and they are not good. Hmm. The, the pay was fine. The pay was good. They, they don't underpay their employees. It's not like it's a, it's, it's not one of those situations. It's more of, uh, how do I put this? Amazon works their employees like no other, yeah, or right. so they say. And, you know, we've heard where they, you know, they can be borderline cruel. Like there was a, a woman who actually came back from a, a pregnancy. And within the first, and like within her getting back within 24 hours, they sent her an email saying, we'll be monitoring your performance to make sure that your attention is still on your job. Huh. Like they, they hawk everything. They, 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 you know, they say that lunch is 
exactly 29 minutes and 59 seconds long, not 30 minutes and one second because they will dock your pay and do write-ups on you. They have just such, I don't know, such strict rules to working at Amazon and they're enforced with technology. They know exactly at all times where everyone is. They know how long your bathroom breaks are. There's even reports out that they kind of treat the bathroom as an extension to your office. If you're if you're in the bathroom, they can expect you. Already dialed into this show. Sorry. Only one. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, no, but they they think that if you're in the bathroom, you can still get work done while you're in the bathroom, and they expect that of you. They, yeah, it, it's uh. Anyways, they've not been getting a lot of good press. So, in comes the story from GeekWire. It's a full memo of Jeff Bezos. He's of course the CEO of Amazon. And he responds to the brutal New York Times story. Uh, it says it doesn't represent the Amazon that he leads. So, yeah, he, you know, the, uh, the article, he has a quote here from Jeff Bezos. Uh, quote, the article doesn't describe the Amazon I know or the caring Amazonians I work with every day. But if you know of any stories like these report, of, like those reported, I want you to escalate to HR. You can also email me directly at jeff at amazon.com. Even if it's rare or isolated, our tolerance for any such lack of empathy needs to be zero. And of course, uh, you know, he also added later in, in the memo saying that I strongly believe that anyone working in a company that really is like the one described in the New York Times would be crazy to stay. I know I would leave such a company. So... He released he he released his full page memo to all the uh, Amazonians, I guess as he calls them, mm -hmm. saying that it's uh, you know if you know of any stories like the one that have been leaking to the press lately, and by the way, not saying that there's any valid claim because I haven't went and checked their employment dates or anything like that to anyone who are releasing these stories, but Amazon traditionally has one of the highest turnover rates of any Fortune 500 company. People usually only last about a year at Amazon before they leave. Wow. So, not, you know, not a good track record. Not a good track record. Not a good track record. Uh, because you think because they actually pay again pretty well for all of their positions, but the working conditions there there was one gentleman who actually worked in in uh, in the management sector. And he said that it was not uncommon to see someone crying at their desk at least once a week because oh. the stress was just too much. Jeez. So Jeff is trying to get is trying to get out ahead of this thing, saying if you know of anything like this, uh, you know, please report it. We, we this isn't Amazon that that we're trying to portray to the public. And as to and everything short of actually seeing employment records of, of these stories and doing the legwork and knowing that these are found to be true it's uh it's kind of a he said she said kind of thing but of course there's a lot of stories out there about the horrid working conditions of amazon which i guess at the end of the day that's not something you'd like here because everyone loves amazon amazon has a lot of good uh publicity backlogged they they do great shipping they have great products they have a very easy to use very great platform but if you know that all of that is being undermined by a lack of empathy to its employees and you know that the employees working there are just being hammered day after day to in increase productivity uh, you're not a person do meet your meet your numbers blah 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 and they're just hammered into the ground that's uh, you know that that's Apple territory right there. You know it's uh, it's interesting because uh, when you see things about Google, for example, and you look at the work environment there, and everything looks so relaxed, and uh, everything is they've got the big courtyards and they got the great, I mean, the environment itself looks you know wonderful, and it's and you look and say, but that's a place that I would like to work at. You know? Much different than a stereotypical tech company. They 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 look very cozy, right? Exactly, and very relaxed. And and and, and uh, to to let creativity um, come forth, and because of the environment, and you see that, and you've I've seen that in tours. You see, I've seen it in 
and all kinds of things about Google. And, and, and other smaller companies do the same kind of same relaxed atmosphere. So um, to see that about Amazon, um, that's, that is disconcerting. Yeah, Amazon is the opposite of, uh, of relax, according to these people. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I heard another story about, and, and this was actually true, this one has been you know, uh, proven, was that one of their warehouses, they didn't have air conditioning. And instead of letting, instead of putting it in, they found it was cheaper to have an ambulance uh, sit outside the warehouse and take people to the hospital as they fainted, rather than put in air conditioning into the warehouse. Wow. <laughs> and again, that's happening in America. This isn't China where we have where we don't have regulation. This is happening here in the U.S. So it's uh, not looking good for Amazon. And hopefully they can either prove that all these stories are false and that they are isolated incidents or better show just how or just show the working conditions and maybe even improve them if they are true drastically. That that would be a great step in the right direction. But Amazon getting pretty beat up in the past couple of days. Hmm. All right. Well, um, the other piece of news is I think we've been connected to the network now for about uh, seven or eight minutes, um, and uh, it, it hasn't rejected us. So it looks like that uh, we're on the air. And hopefully, and if that's true, you were just you've just been joining us. So we're just doing a story about Amazon. But welcome into a Monday edition of the Computer America program. We just had some technical difficulties. Uh, hopefully, uh, we are broadcasting on on Blog Talk Radio now as well. Um, so let's continue on, and uh, we'll uh, see how things move along. Move along. Uh, this this is an interesting, interesting story. This is from uh, uh, Maximum PC, and uh, uh, I know you have a sixty-four gig uh, uh, solid state drive, which is extremely tiny. Well, this article says Samsung renders your solid state drive puny. With not a two terabyte, not a four, not an eight, but a sixteen terabyte model. So yeah, you didn't think things were bad enough. Yeah, raising the storage on this, raising the uh, the storage ceiling, so to speak. Uh, now this uh, story is by Paul Lilly, and he says that the uh, um, Samsung uh, was at the uh, 2015 Flash Memory Summit. I didn't know they had a Flash Memory Summit. I know. Uh, I don't. Well, I had not heard of the flash memory summit, but definitely they do have one. You will never be able to keep up with the amount of summits that are held around the world every year. There, there, there. It is insurmountable how many summits there are. Yeah. Well, evidently, Samsung, when they came out, they went onto the show floor and announced, "Ladies and gentlemen, we present you with the PM sixteen thirty three A." A 16 terabyte solid state drive and a 2.5 inch four factor. That's the best part. <laughs> the 2.5 inch form factor because you could get a giant box and hook them up in a raid or hook them up together, and you could get, you know, four four gig or um, sorry, four four terabyte solid state drives, and that'd be all connected to a NAS and it'd be a big bulky box. But hey, you could claim it was a 16 terabyte. This was all done in one uh, solid state drive case, two which is the amazing part. Yeah, and it's two and a half inch form factor. Yeah. So when Paul Lilly goes on and says, what I, he says, what I imagine happened next is the representative who announced the drive turned the mic sideways, dropped it, and walked away. <laughs> as usual, as usual. Uh, because that's all you really would have to do. Uh, but, you know, obviously it didn't go down that way. Obviously, you, you would like to give people some, some details. Yeah, right. And... Uh, <laughs> And he goes on to say that he th now his 960 gig solid state array drive array feels pedestrian. Uh, wow! If, if you have a 960 gigabyte feeling and you feel pedestrian, what do you think with the with the 64 gig uh, version? Four. Are you asking me if I feel pedestrian? <laughs> you must be down and crawling at this point. No, 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 no. I feel outdated. That that's the big thing. <laughs> okay, but well, th there's outdated, and then there's what 16 terabyte because we just talked about. Uh, an eight terabyte the other day, and that and that was I kid you not that was about a month ago, yeah. and I believe it was also Samsung who yeah. who released it. They're like, hey, check out this eight terabyte, and we were gushing, yeah. gushing over the eight terabyte. Well, and now this, yeah, they've doubled it. This is now the most 
uh, capacious single drive around. It is now the new champion. Now, a little of the uh, tech deal details on this uh, drive. Um, uh, Samsung's using their new 256 uh, gigabit TLC flash memory technology. Uh, this is the third generation of 3D VNAND memory, and it consists of 48 layers of three bits per cell on a single die. Jeez. Now, crazy. Yeah. Um, he, he goes on to say that not only is this the most capacious uh, uh, then uh, solutions based on the second generation VNAN consisting of 32 layers of three bits per cell. But according to Samsung, it sports improved read and write performance along with better power efficiency. Now, for the price, drum roll. <laughs> Samsung didn't say, and I wouldn't, I, I am not the least bit surprised that Samsung didn't say. But uh, as Paul says, uh, he says, I suspect it's in the neighborhood of an arm and a leg. <laughs> I would think so. I mean, how much were they asking for the 8 terabyte? Do you remember? The 8 it terabyte, yeah, was, uh, I think the 8 terabyte was somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,000 something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah. I'm looking at some of the reader comments of this article. One guy says, shut up and take my money already. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a common meme on the internet, but um, just looked up this other article from Tech Times, of course, talking about the same thing. And they, you know, they would kind of say that, or at least they're estimating the cost of this thing would be about five grand. You know, I get five grand for one hard drive. It's, it's of course, bleeding edge. It's, it's all new. It's the largest on the market if they, you know, when it does arrive on the market. It's solid state, not traditional uh, magnetic hard drive. It has everything going for it, but five grand just for a hard drive. And you know what's really sad is when you pay that five grand, and then like like six months or a year goes by, and then you can find it, you know, for nine hundred or something. <laughs> I like, guess that's what's well, gonna happen. that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna they're gonna I, keep making. I wouldn't say it was it would be that precipitous. Like it would be if you paid five grand today. Probably in a year, you could pay two grand, and then like eighteen months, it's mm -hmm. definitely going to be less than half. It's definitely going to be less than half than it was. And not only that, not only is it going to be less than half than what you pay for it, there's going to be something better out there. Eighteen oh, of months, course. Right? of course. But uh -huh. if you have to have the the newest thing, the biggest thing, the most awesome thing, folks, if you came up to me on the street and said, "Hey, Ben." I just picked up the new 16 terabyte solid state drives from, from Samsung. I would be impressed. I'm not going to say, oh, why'd you do that? That was silly. No, this thing is impressive. Yeah, it is. It's, it's extremely impressive to have that kind of capacity and for that kind of money. Uh, and, uh, uh, but there it is. Um, and uh, a 16 terabyte solid state drive in a two, two and a half inch form factor. With faster reads and faster writes, and uh, and better power consumption, on all all I mean, this is really this is this is cutting edge. It's bleeding edge, and of course, anything that's cutting edge or bleeding edge, you're going to pay for it. There's no question about it. And I guess we have to say at this point, folks, what are you doing with all this data storage? Why do you need 16 gigs? Well, you have to lo load Windows 10 on my computer. That's why Windows 10 <laughs> takes up exactly. Yeah. Uh, what 20 gigs mm -hmm. that leaves you another 15.911 no or something like that anyways tons upon tons of storage this thing will have you covered you wouldn't even need a, a nas a, a nas storage anymore option 16 terabytes would have you covered that thing is crazy like not even 16 gigs all state which is again on its own very impressive but that's bigger than than a lot of traditional hard drives. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Greg. I, I, you know, I'm trying to think of the last time I heard of a of, of a traditional hard drive having 16 terabytes of storage in one unit. No, it, it is. It's it's, un, it's really. I mean, I never thought we would hit that point where solid state drives would pass surpass. I always thought that magnetic drives would be less expensive and have far more capacities, and to see a solid state drive 
with 16 terabytes, which you, re I think the largest hard comp drive capacity that I've seen is like, is, is like, I think six or eight terabytes. Yeah. Uh, on a single platter, and here they've got a solid state drive with 16 terabytes. Yeah, of course, um, solid state drive is what? What about a about, about anywhere from 50 to 70 percent faster than a hard? Yeah, than yeah, for sure. And I'm just and I was just looking up, and the only option I could find for a traditional hard drive are, of course, external options, and really the only one offering out of the box 16 terabyte uh, support. Is of course by the company uh, Lacy, L A C C I E, Lassie. and they Lacy, uh -huh. Lacy, and they have a 16 terabyte external unit, and of course, very pretty. If you've never seen their stuff, definitely go check it out. But again, you know, they're offering a 16 terabyte external hard drive, even for a traditional hard drive, it's 1,400 bucks. And, and I bet you it's not one. It's not on one single platter. Oh no, 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 no. It, it's uh, four four terabytes. That are, of course, in this one box hooked up in a RAID, and uh, and I'll tell you, it's it's not it's not a two and a half inch form factor either. It's probably a three and a half inch drive uh, uh, form factor. Uh, I don't know. It's a it's a pretty big hunking system. So to get sixteen terabytes on any hard drive, let alone a solid state drive from Samsung, this is awesome news. It is. It is. Because if you do need it, I mean, it's there. I wonder how much the eight terabyte version of that did that drop in price now. <laughs> oh, uh, I probably not actually, because again, we were just talking about like a month or two ago. Why? Why would they already do a price drop on that? Uh, the 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 technology is just is just screaming fast uh, to 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 come out with a. a this is almost like a quantum leap, really. Solid state drives, because I wasn't expecting to see this kind of capacity, uh, let alone on a two and a half inch form factor for what another couple of years. Yeah, easily I thought maybe at least two more years, and here we have it now. See, and it's also nice because something like this, these are the kinds of things that are going to go into uh, into server farms, into racks, into all this, into data storage centers. These are the kind of hard drives that are just going to be used en mass to power the servers of tomorrow because well, you may not need, ever need 16 terabyte, but there's a push going on uh, and we have had people on the show lately. We've, we've talked about it. There's a push to put everything into the cloud, to put all of your data, to put all your processes, to put everything into the cloud. And if you have server racks, if you had memory racks just stuffed full of these 16 terabytes, it would be fast. It would be clean and small. And it, it, small. And just imagine, like there's less heat, which is huge in in data centers. It's of course, yeah, as Craig said, small. So you can put more in, in a smaller square footage. This is how, in the future, you know, data farms are going to cope with the amount of data we're we're putting into the cloud. It's stuff like this. Yeah, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about server farms, but you know, you can put this stuff into a laptop. You know, oh, you can put it into a Chromebook. What are you talking about? Yeah. So um, there's certainly that as well. Um, um, it's just a uh, just uh, really crazy. It's it's, it's nice to see, but wow, I can't believe we're there already. Yeah. Uh, again, if you'd asked me, I, I wouldn't have thought this was possible so fast. So. All right, so Samsung again, sixty terabyte, and again, if you're listening to us on Log Talk Radio, welcome to the show because uh, we we had a, a little uh, Log Talk Radio is having some technical difficulties. There's a, a flag that they put up for us, uh, and it's not cleared yet. It's still saying that they're currently experiencing technical difficulties. We don't know for sure if we're on Blog Talk Radio. Maybe you can, uh, while I do this next story, Ben, you can you can listen to Blog you Talk. You're gonna do two stories in a row. Oh, okay. All right. You, all right. How you, dare you? You do the yeah. You do the next story. Then I think I uh, and I uh, and then uh, no, I have no way of checking it. You'd have to check it. So yep. Okay. Right, let's let's tiptoe and then we'll check during during the commercial break, which is okay. why they're there. Oh yeah. But okay. yeah, no, we, we have about a minute and a half, so we're going to start on this one, and then we'll you know go into the video and just what it means mm -hmm. in, uh, right after the break. But to start off. This was the big news today. I found it on almost every single tech site I go to to aggregate news. And Google works their employees to death. No, Google. <laughs> kidding. Google announces Project Sunroof Initiative to help cover your roof in solar panels. Oh. Yeah. So 
solar power is a big thing or at least it's becoming a big thing. The efficiencies are getting up there. Solar panels are getting easier and cheaper to, to produce. It's actually becoming kind of financially viable if you can afford the initial cost to put solar panels on your roof. Because in, in the long run, hopefully over the life of the solar panels, uh, of course, they, they will hopefully pay for themselves and then, and then some, and then feed back into the... Uh, Feedback into the system. Wow. The, the power grid. All right. Well, let's, and, we're nope. coming to the break. And uh, what we'll do is we'll continue on. Uh, you're listening to the uh, Computer America Show. Uh, ben and I are doing computer technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. We have a, two brand new news tips full of review from Marty Winston. That's all coming up. Uh, we'll be right back with more right after these words. Stay tuned. You're listening to Computer America. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule, your company's getting ready for its IPO, and you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect day WX254L works SD, semi-automatic driver. To follow the gun metaphor, it's a little more like a revolver. It uses a six-chamber cylinder that holds a different bit. Since it appears you're calling back into a live show, we are reconnecting you now. Standard screwdriver bits in one cylinder and comes with a second cylinder holding things like hex bits, star bits, and a screw starter drill. You can change bits or cylinders by racking back a top slide for access. There's a front white LED work light to let you see your work target. A wall wart charges its 4 volt lithium internal battery as confirmed by a red LED on the bottom of the handle. Bottom line, the model WX254L Works SD semi-automatic driver is a spin and win solution to never going far to find the bit you need to fit what you're doing now. Marty Winston with a News Tips Bullet Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show, 33 minutes past the hour. And yeah, to everyone out there listening to uh, yeah. uh, Blog Talk Radio, 
Unfortunately, we are experiencing some issues. We'll have them sorted out, hopefully, by the middle of tonight or tonight, or worst case scenario, tomorrow. Yeah. This is on, on the network side. Can't do anything about it. For once, we can safely say, it's not our fault. <laughs> but it still does not help you, the listener, so we apologize. But, of course, you can always pick us up on Google Hangouts and... Uh, our live video feed, yeah, our live yeah, video. Yeah, our, our, our live video feed. So you can always go there and check that out. And we will, of course, have archives in case you have been wanting to listen to it. And, you know, you have someone out there who is listening to the sound. You're like, I can't hear Compete America. It's okay. You can always listen to us here. So uh, continuing on with this uh, whole story about Project Sunroof, uh-huh. the new initiative from Google... And there's a video that we're actually going to play right here. And oh, look at that. Yeah, uh, it, it's a video. And the video goes on to explain that solar power, yeah, j- just to be frank about it, sun hits everyone's roofs every day of the week. It's just a thing that happens. And mm-hmm. a lot of people, they don't have the means, they don't have the technology they don't have the wherewithal or even know if it's uh, you know financially viable to put solar panels on their roof because heck there's there's thing like shade you don't know if your face if your house is facing the right direction you don't even know if if it's worth doing in the first place enter google google can use uh, the google maps that we all use for navigation for travel for all that kind of thing and using existing data built into their maps, they can actually superimpose the amount of sunlight that a any given area receives. Of course, just to be upfront about all this, this is only done so far in three different cities. Uh, I believe there's one in New Hampshire that's doing it, uh, the Bay Area where Google is located, and then one in... uh, I won't say San Antonio, but no, uh, but but one one other in California. Okay, San Antonio is in Texas. Yeah. Yes, I know San Antonio is in Texas, <laughs> but one other uh, in in California is you know this is actually happening, though they hope to soon enough roll it out to the rest of the U.S. and as they say potentially the world. And again, just to cover what it does, it'll give you the street view of your house, and then using a sliding color chart from purple to red, or you know pur- purple to yellow it will show you the amount of shade and amount of sunlight that any given building has going for it. So let's say you're not really sure if your roof gets a lot of shade or a lot of sun. You can actually see, go to Google Street View, look at your house, and see that it's bright red, which means it receives a lot of sunlight during the day and Mm -hmm. is actually optimal for putting solar panels on your uh you know, putting solar panels on your roof and then through the same tool of using this project sunroof, it will actually connect you with their own service of local solar panel providers and installers and then be able to connect you to them. And of course you can then go and try to order all that kind of stuff on your own, but it has a lot of, it has, it has a huge Q and a feature. If you don't know anything about what we're talking about, but project sunroof is again in three cities and they hope to roll it out to the rest of the U.S. But again, this hit every single tech site because of the implications behind it. It's a very cool idea because, let's face it, sol- solar panels right now, they're getting better all the time. And we have massive solar farms, but there's nothing keeping us from putting one on every roof. And it's really being underutilized. It, it, we're seeing it pop up in a couple places. Uh, we just had our... A, What's his title now? We just have our we just had our web our our webmaster out in Colorado. Yeah, and he went to a and he yeah. saw a church. Mm-hmm. Yes, a church with solar panels all over the steeple roofs. They're pretty, they're very progressive out there, in Colorado. Yeah, I know. So you know, even even some churches are getting into the solar power thing, and of course, using this Project Sunroof, whenever it rolls out, will of course keep you up to date when it rolls out for the rest of the, of the U.S. But yeah, it's uh, it's gonna show you in a very easy to see kind of color, color coordinated way, mm-hmm. and heck, if you're if you were thinking about it, this would be a great resource to telling you if you, frankly, if it's worth it for you. 
Hmm. Well, um, I've always th I've been of the, the, the belief that uh, getting off the grid or doing as much as you can to uh, get off it uh, is a great thing. Uh, it, many states will even pay, well, the government will, will, will actually pay you to install uh, this type of technology or reimburse you after you know, in some states. They, have, they give you credits, yes. Yeah. And also some of the state, not only federal, but also states, depending on what state you live, will also uh, uh, contribute to that. Of course, those are drying up more and more because when solar solar panels on homes was first announced, it was prohib like, prohibitively right now, it, right now is prohibitively expensive. But back then, it was ridiculously expensive. Like you would not do it under any circumstances. So, of course, they had to give out tax credits for people who would do it. And, you know, you get 5K here, 4K here, 2K here, whatever it was, and it helped drive down the price. But nowadays, solar panels, they're actually getting cheaper and cheaper to, to produce month after month. But and, to, and, and there's more companies installing them, so you don't have to rely on just one person that can kind of uh, price, I wouldn't say price gouge, but it's a very specialized industry. You have so to be, you have to be careful too because not all solar panels are created the same. So you that to, too. You know, make sure that you're getting something that is the latest uh, technology because if you're getting something that's kind of old, uh, it's going to get older even faster. You know, so uh, and then, that too. But the point I was I, was, I kind of wanted to make there was that it's not as new of an industry as it was back in the beginning. So there aren't going to be as many tax credits and tax benefits. Like I don't want you going out there and finding old information and saying, Oh, look, we can rely on this tax credit on this credit on this credit, and then find out that they canceled that back in 2014, 2013. So keep up to date. There are definitely fewer of them out there. Of course the, you know, I'm talking about these credits, mm -hmm. but even so, it's getting to the point where solar panels are cheaper and they're more efficient and there are more companies to install them. So it may just be worth it even without any credits. It may be worth it for yourself to, you know, do it yourself. Absolutely. I mean, as I said, uh, it makes, it does make a lot of sense. The more you can get off the grid, uh, the, although the, the initial shock might be uh, expensive, eventually it's going to pay for itself. And, uh, and actually, in many cases, you'll be able to sell that power back to the electric company and actually make money. So um, That is the dream. Yeah, that is to, dream. To, to get that power bill and then to see not, oh, I owe them how many hundreds of dollars, but to get that bill and say, oh, well, look, they, they just paid me $32. That is the dream. That is the dream. Uh-huh. Okay, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do uh, uh, the story. Uh, we might have time to do two, but I know you're going to try to get the uh, the guest uh, online, um, and we'll, we'll, that'll confirm everything is uh, up and running. Um, but this story from P Maximum PC is entire again. This is from Kevin Parrish. Uh, Apple Boot Camp. Remember Boot Camp? You know, it allowed you to boot into Windows. Uh, it's not like parallels which allows you to let, let you run windows and the mac at the same time but it is a solution well evidently now apple boot camp 6 now supports windows 10. so before boot camp 6 was released in other words this came out after windows 10 was released it just probably missed it by a hair um but now there's an apple support page revealing that boot camp 6 for mac is compatible with windows 10. okay so what does that mean to you? Well, basically, y you can now use OS 10 on a supported OS 10 Yosemite Mac machine. Okay. Um, does what about what about the cap? What is it, uh, Captain? El, El Capitan. El Capitan doesn't man mention El Capitan, which is the latest version of the Mac. It, it says on a Yosemite machine. You can now is, is El Capitan out, or is that the one in beta, and they will eventually push it out? El Capitan is out. That's what oh, I'm saying. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, uh, Yosemite, if you have a Yosemite machine, it will work. Uh, now, unfortunately, again, according to Maxim PC, Boot Camp only supports the 64-bit version of Windows 10. You know, I mean, okay, 32-bit is pretty much over. I mean, it's it's legacy technology, 
everything is 64 bit. And it's getting to the point now where, okay, it's like when you're talking about floppy disks and optical media, you know, it, it, these things are going to go by. If you, uh, I think this. But I think the difference here is that you don't have to convince the people to use 64 bit because the people obviously want whatever's new. 64 bit and 32 bit, the, the real person there that is suffering that has to deal with that are the application developers and everyone else who has to switch over to a 64 bit. But or, yeah, you know, scheme. But 64 bit for the Mac has been out for a number of years now. So oh yeah, same for Windows. Same for Windows. So there's really no more excuse. I think I think most all of those people, all the applications now that you need, all the important ones have 64 bit versions. And if you're running a 32 bit version, you know, well, listen, it's time to move on. Get the 64 bit. And if you want to run Windows 10 on your Mac, this is what you're going to need to do. Okay. Uh, now, according to this, this Apple support page, uh, boot camp users can install Windows 10 in two ways. You can perform a new install or perform an upgrade install. Okay. Uh, both will require the Windows 10 ISO provided by Microsoft, which can be used to create a DVD or a bootable USB flash drive. Okay. Um, now, a list of features that Windows 10 support will include the USB 3.0 and USB-C, Thunderbolt, an Apple keyboard, trackpad, and mouse, uh, the Apple SuperDrive, that's the USB version or the built-in, and a built-in SD and SDXC card slots. Those are all supported uh, with this Windows 10 through this version of uh, Boot Camp. Um, okay. Um, okay. So they're getting a lot of uh, a lot of upgrades. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Apple customers who wanted to install Windows 10 need to make sure that they have the latest version of OS 10 and Boot Camp Assistant. That's the Mac firmware. It must also be up to date in order to play host to Microsoft's OS uh, Windows 10. Okay. Uh, this comes across, obviously. Microsoft Windows 10 has been launched, has been uh, around for at least two weeks now, and it's a, obviously a, a terrific operating system. Uh, I talked to Parallels. They said the latest version of Parallels will support Windows 10, um, and that's pretty much that. Um, um, just FYI, uh, the, the flag that says they're having uh, trouble with the host and guest lines uh, continues to uh, be present. So Ben's going to try to get a hold of uh, our, our guest from uh, uh, dictionary.com, and then we'll see if we can make it happen. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, we're fighting technical glitches and technical difficulties, and we're just, try we're just trying to make it happen. Anyway, Apple says that once customers install Windows 10, they can install iTunes for Windows uh, and uh, to listen to their music and watch their videos. However, uh, customers make sh need to make sure that Windows 10 platform is authorized to play those files, obviously. Okay. Um, I don't know. Do, uh, so let, let me see if I can dial her, Ben. Let me see if I can, I can do that because it, it allows. All right. It, it's allowing All right. You well, uh, if you're done with that story of, of course, the boot camp and Mac and Windows 10, all that great stuff, all new stuff playing together nicely. There's a new, there's another story out, and this is, of course, near and dear to my heart because I really do enjoy uh, Twitch. Twitch is a great platform for gamers to stream their video games to other gamers to anyone who wants to watch. It's a, it's a really fun place with a lot of chat, and the people there are entertaining to 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 give it a word, and at worst case, they're maybe a little abrasive, but. They have shown before that they can work together, that they can do something that no one thought was possible. And they're about to take on yet another challenge that even I have to say, okay, that's impossible. And that is, of course, there is a game called Dark Souls. For anyone out there who doesn't know, Dark Souls is a video game released a couple years ago. And it was wildly popular, not because it was easy or stunning, it was popular because it was actually rather difficult, which is a nice uh, a nice deviation from how video games were getting. And while some people kind of at, at the beginning complained, this is too hard, why, why would you do this? The traditionalists out there said, you know what, this is what the gaming industry needs. It's a video game that isn't 
isn't just, you know, plow through it, look at the pretty pictures and go on about your day. This one actually took some skill and you, you know, you were going to die a couple times. So this on the heels of, and, and you're kind of wondering, okay, you went from Twitch to a video game. How does that even matter? Well, Twitch has a not so long history of giving people the ability to control a video game using user input commands through the Twitch chat. And this was done for Pokemon. It took them a while, but they finally did it. It it has done it for a couple other games. Uh, you know, I'm sure by now they set up the software so that you input a chat, you input a command into the chat, the program would read it, and then of course input that into the game. So up, down, left, right, A, B, all that kind of thing. Very easy to do for Pokemon. Well, here comes the impossible part. They are now going to attempt to try this with Dark Souls, and it's really? using the hmm? really Dark Souls. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, it's attempting to use a new system called, or it's actually the difference between. Uh, it's called Anarchy versus Democracy, and this system, Anarchy, anyone who puts in a, who puts in a a command in the chat. So let's say you say up, the controller will do up. If some guy in South America said uh, B, the controller will do B. And that's anarchy. It's just whatever anyone says, hopefully by the end of that entire long string, the character does something relevant. And, you know, of, of course, this is pretty easy to do with Pokemon. It's pretty easy to do with a couple of the older games. But for something as advanced as Dark Souls, this probably won't work. And then the other system is, of course, democracy, where every 10 seconds it will take whichever command is listed most, and it will perform that command. So if 100 people said up and three people said B, it will do the command up. This, this makes it a little bit better, but at the same time, it makes the gameplay slower, and it may not have the reaction speed that you need. So, you know, they're trying this with Dark Souls. You can go watch it right now. Unfortunately, the main character, after four days, three hours, 17 minutes, and 12 seconds, uh, they have gotten exactly... They haven't even left the starting area. Let's put it like that. They haven't even left the starting area after four days of nonstop playing by the Twitch community. So they can try all they want. They can try and try and try. You can go check us out anytime. This is, of course, over at twitch.com. And, yeah, you know see where it goes there there was i believe twitch even had one setup where someone's fish it was a beta fish was actually playing pokemon using a webcam so you know there, there are weird things all over twitch and this is just another one of them but it was actually pretty cool because it's it's bringing people together there are thousands of people trying to input commands to get you know to get through dark souls and to see if it actually works with all the craziness and just the hive mind mentality, we're going to see. Yeah. Um, by the way, I'm trying to get our guest to uh, call in and uh, herself to, to we're going to see if she can call in the show and then we can bring her on. If not, we'll just uh, have to. Uh, uh, OK, well, then it won't work. All right. Well, why don't you do it? Why don't you uh, do another story while I call her back? OK. All right. Yeah, sure. Uh, Another story, another story. How about, um, okay, well, we talked about Twitch and crazy people and groups of crazy people and all that they can accomplish. So let's hit something a little bit heavier. And a little bit heavier, I mean, is, is of course, going to be this one from Ars Technica. And it's uh, the IRS. Was it recently hacked? That's not good. People really, really like their tax records. So, yeah, the, uh, the IRS estimate of tax records stolen by fraudsters sourced over 300,000 people. And, and not even people, because, of course, some people file joint tax returns. So we're going to call this 300,000 households. 300,000 households have been or have had their tax records compromised. They said that using data from previous corporate breaches, fraudsters frolicked in IRS transcript data. So more than three months after the IRS shut down its online tax transcript service because of a massive identity theft uh, effort, 
the IRS is now acknowledging that the number of affected taxpayers is more than three times the initial estimate. That's not good. Yeah, so uh, the number of affected taxpayers may continue to grow as the agency digs into locks of hundreds of thousands of connections to its Get Transcript application over the past year. So uh, the agency announced that there were in total more than 600,000 suspicious attempts made to create user accounts on the transcript system using what appear to be a uh, stolen personal uh, identifying information from recent credit card breaches and other corporate hacks. Not good. So there is a service, if you didn't know, IRS has it on uh, irs.gov, I'm sure. It's, uh, you can get a transcript of your, of of course, you know, your taxes online and all that it required to set up, I guess, was some identifying information, which I'm sure was, you know, mother's maiden name, address, and uh, a couple other things. Mm. So all that kind of stuff, they were easily able to get that through other hacks. Mm. And by putting it into the IRS transcripts that wasn't as secure as it should have been, of course, using some kind of bot and be able to get their tax transcripts. And I'm sure they were able to even glean some kind of uh, financial you know, information from that, which they can then, you know, go to apply for loans, which they can then go to, you know, get mortgages, whatever it may be, and steal money that way, huh. hit, again, 300,000 people. 300,000 of the 600,000 attempts succeeded. Wow. Crazy. So, you know, it's uh, originally the IRS believed that about 200,000 attempts were made to, you know, were made to the get transcript and a hundred thousand were successful. That number has of course tripled when looking through the actual attempts. It's uh, yeah. And, and of course it's still possible to obtain your tax transcript through the mail by sending a letter with a social security number, date of birth and address okay. from the most recent tax return, yeah. but it's still possible to, you know, for this to happen. So they took the whole thing down. Wow. Low tech. Yeah. Like nothing nothing beats a stamp and a piece of paper, I guess. <laughs> well, like you could still get compromised that way because someone could, hey, go inside your mailbox and take your tax transcript. It, 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 but the amount of people that are able to do that, I mean, how many people are walking in front of your mailbox every day? Well, if you live in a crowded city, you know, it may be a couple hundred. If you, you live take, in, in a quiet neighborhood, it may be a couple dozen. You could take but it on online. It's literally everyone online could do this you could take it to the post office though you know and then 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 you hand it to the but then you have to trust the postal worker that they're not going to take it <laughs> there there there's holes everywhere it's oh. just online they found a massive gaping one and again this is uh this was a two-part fail because the first part was that the, was that the hackers the you know the fraudulent or the people making the fraudulent uh claims to the irs transcript app mm -hmm. they compromise the data from other sources through other companies through other security leaks outside of the social security offices and then using that information they were to they were eight they were easily able to input it quickly and efficiently into the get transcript which then was sent out to the wrong address you know of course the fraud the fraudulent user so the you know they, they took it down because it was too easy but IRS wasn't really hacked more than it was scammed. Hmm. Well, um, so uh, the, what's the result of people going to? Uh, um, uh, what's, I'm sure they're alerting as many people as fast as possible. I'm sure if you have, well, yeah, I'm not even sure because they said that the initial estimate of 100,000 people, tur you know, has turned into 300,000 people. So uh, check your credit reports, check your credit cards, make sure nothing is happening on on your dime. Uh, you know, be as safe as possible, be alert as possible, mm -hmm. and of course, you know, just just keep an eye and an ear out. It, uh, if I recall correctly, this was mainly targeted towards uh, employees of the government. So if you are a government employee, be triple sure that this is that any kind of fraudulent activity isn't happening on your credit. 
All right. Well, uh, just as an update here, uh, uh, we can't get in, we can't make contact with uh, Liz McMillan, the uh, CEO of Dictionary.com. I just got off the phone with her and said that and I apologized and said that we will uh, reschedule her to be on. And for those of you who are wanted to, uh, uh, a Nana Box who was going to be our first hour guest. Uh, that wasn't a technical glitch. Although if they had been scheduled to be on tonight's show, guess what? We would have had to reschedule them as well. Uh, but the, it's a legal issue. Uh, they talked to their lawyers, and uh, their lawyers said no. Uh, we have they have some big things in the works, and they recommended that they do not go public on any broadcast medium until these things are resolved. So we'll be uh, we'll we will be in oddly enough. The device about saying anonymous doesn't want a you know publicity. How well, odd. Yeah. Well, that's what their lawyers said. So we'll. I've talked to the PR guy, and he said they will be rescheduling uh, when they get clearance from their legal department. That's okay. The, yeah. This kind of thing happens. Yeah, it does. And uh, we've got another hour of computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. Uh, we're going to be gone just for a moment, and then we'll be right back with more. Don't go anywhere. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at computeramerica.com. Hello and welcome into hour two of the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co host, Ben. And uh, we continue on. Uh, if you're just joining us now, uh, we are experiencing uh, network technical difficulties. It is not on our end, it is definitely the network. Uh, our caller lines are down. Uh, host and guest lines are both down, and uh, we cannot make uh, contact. Had we had them scheduled on Google Hangouts, we could have had the interview. But uh, as it turns out, uh, 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 Liz McMillan, who is the CEO of Dictionary.com, uh, was going to be was going to be a telephone interview, and we cannot make a phone connection via the network. So uh, we'll just have to reschedule them for. Another time. Aww. I know you're disappointed, but you know these kinds of things happen. Yeah, that's it. Does it happens? Um, <clears throat> now uh, we're going to continue doing uh, computer technology news, but uh, do we want to talk at all yet about your Windows 10 experience, or do we? Because this will be a great time to do it. Or do you want to? Mm. Yeah, you know, we uh, Windows 10 experience. I've I've been using it, and okay, so you have it installed. All right. All right. Yeah, as as I said before, and I went over Friday about how I was able to install it using two separate hard drives built into the same case, yep. which is not really an option out of the box if you're trying to install Windows 10. So go back and check out Friday night's broadcast. I believe we had a Ralph Bond. Check out the whole hour or you know the whole two hours. It was a great show. But somewhere in the middle there, we talked about Windows 10 and our experiences and how I was able to do a workaround to get Windows 10 on my system. Just FYI, we had an unprecedented amount of downloads for that show. I don't know why. I mean, it was good. But Wait, we, why? Because it was amazing. It was the best show we've ever done. Well, well there it is. We had an unprecedented amount of downloads. Probably, I think it's at, at the history of the show is one of the biggest downloads that we've uh, accounts that we've had. So Craig is the only one surprised by this. It was an amazing show. I I, I don't know why he's surprised. <laughs> okay, well, and there you should go back and check it out if you didn't. Yeah, color me surprised. All right, there it is. So, uh, 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 so uh, as Ben said, now the other thing that you uh, have not talked about yet, and I don't know if we, because we have. Whoa, 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 wait, wait! You're, you're gonna give me thirty seconds to talk about Windows Ten? No, oh, no, go ahead, please continue. <laughs> you just kind of cut me off there. But, uh, um, regardless, three monitor setup. That was my other big news. Uh, I have three monitors. Set up and using Windows 10. One of the really nice features is traditionally with Windows, if you had more than one monitor set up, you can only have one taskbar where you, you would have the start button, the all the programs you have open, and yeah. that would just be on the main monitor. Windows 10 thankfully lets you have that uh, that bar across the bottom on as many monitors as you have. So you don't have to always go back to the home monitor. You can use any monitor that you're actually focusing on as your main monitor. Very, very nice. 
nice new feature for and that's a new feature to windows 10. yeah yep. right. nice new, nice new feature of windows 10. uh all in all i gotta say i'm not and i guess to some point this is a good thing i'm not really using windows 10 uh i'm not using all the new features as much as i thought i would because it works so seamlessly that you kind of forget about the new features because you know I, i'm using the search bar a lot more often because it's uh just with, with everything just slightly reorganized and you can kind of see where it is where it's at after you search for it but using the search bar it it searches your computer and searches the internet at the same time amazingly well so that's a very nice feature but i don't really have to go into the live tiles that are at uh you know that they're at the start menu i don't really have to use any of the other you know, new features that come with it. You, if you are upgrading from Windows 7 to Windows 10, and you're like, "Man, I really like Windows 7, but I need to get in on this Windows 10 because it, because it's it's new, and I just got to have new." Yeah, I I free. don't want to miss the boat. and free. Yeah, it, it's new and free. So I you know I got to upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10. If you're anything like me, you really won't new notice anything different. I mean, my computer actually runs a little bit smoother. The operating system has obviously, you know, received a lot of love, and there aren't that many hiccups. It's 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 actually a little bit more responsive than my old system, but at the same time, if you don't want to use any of the new systems, then hey, you don't have to. It's it's it works su surprisingly well. So what you're saying is that even though if you have Windows Seven, you're still saying update to Windows Ten. Just don't use any new features, and, and if you don't yeah. use, you really won't notice any differences. But you should still do the upgrade because it's free, and you really should do that anyway. That's what you're saying. Yeah, you, you should. And I think uh, one one of the things that a lot of people are going to use eventually down the road. Personally, I don't, but eventually I, I will have to, and that's apps. Windows has made sort of an app store where, of course, all the Microsoft products are there. Think Office and, and all that kind of thing. And then there's also all these kinds of games. Xbox is fully integrated with Windows 10. So eventually one day down the road, you'll be able to buy games on your Windows 10, stream them from your Xbox One to your PC. Um, you know, you'll be able to do all this kind of thing. And of course, there's music, movies, TVs, all, your, all of your entertainment, all, all the video games that you could ever want, and any kind of Office apps or any other apps you may ever need. Those eventually... Again, I don't need them right now, but I will be getting them from the Microsoft Store because the Microsoft Store is so obviously where you're going to want to get your heart, you know, is where you're going to want to get your software from. Mm -hmm. So that's one feature that I haven't used yet, but I'm going to see myself using a lot. And it's just better integration between apps and the end user. All of your apps are going to be rolled into Windows 10, and if you get it through their marketplace, you'll know it works, you'll know it'll be downloaded and sorted and put in the proper place, and you know it will work beautifully with the operating system. This might be kind of the beginning of the end of the third-party software distributor. It may all come from Windows 10 and Microsoft at some point, just like Apple and their iTunes, may start carrying apps on their own for desktop computers it's uh you know I, I could i could completely see that happening yeah now um the integration you mentioned the other thing the other piece of news and i want to get back to windows 10 is uh that you now you you are the proud owner of an xbox one a lot of lots been happening in your life i mean you got windows 10 and now you have an xbox one um microsoft has been paying my rent too. No, uh, <laughs> my, Microsoft still won't talk to me. I've been sending them letters, love letters, perfume, <laughs> all that kind of thing, nothing. But um, no, I have recently acquired an Xbox One and this was because it was a business expense since I believe the creators of Destiny, i.e. Bungie, will be coming on the show in the not too distant future and I had to test out their game. Or at least that's what I told my boss. And so, yeah, I, I've i recently got an Xbox One, playing Destiny on it. I'm a little late to the party, but still a very fun game. But the Xbox One, it's everything you, you would expect from a next-gen console. I've played...
played with one before. I've had my hands on one. A lot of my friends have you know had one for a while now, and it's nothing new. But again, Xbox is trailing far behind PlayStation 4 in total units sold. And obviously the ecosystem behind the PlayStation 4, if you're looking for a multiplayer experience, PlayStation 4 right now has it all over Xbox. They just have so many more units, so many more people with controllers in their hands. And for something as social as video gaming, that's kind of where you want to be. But at the same time, Microsoft has been having a really good showing lately. And by lately, I mean the past couple months and you know the past couple big conventions where they're releasing better... Uh, backwards compatibility, their better integration, or you know, they're promising better integration between Windows 10 and uh, the Xbox One. Just laundry list of things that they're doing correctly with the Xbox One to make it better in the future. I think right now, if I had the choice and I wasn't thinking about the future, the PlayStation 4 would still be the one to go with. There, there's just more people. There's just better games. There's more games. PlayStation 4 is where you want to be. But I think in the coming years, and hopefully with as Windows 10 really fleshes out, because I think quite a few people who, who have been on the show, a lot of our correspondents, have come on the show and said, this feature seems like half done, half baked. They've rushed Windows 10 a bit. And quite frankly, in, in regards to the Xbox One, I think they did. I think they rushed Windows 10 out the door, and they're going to be adding in a lot of the interconnectivity towards the holiday season. So in in the long run, the Xbox One was definitely a good purchase. That's uh, I guess that's where I'll leave that at. So you don't, reg- you don't regret getting it? I regret that PlayStation 4 has such a better ecosystem. And ecosystem matters a lot. It, you know, just more people playing more video games. And video games are, of course, so social now. That's where you want to be. But, you know... Got to play the long game. Yeah, it, it, it seems odd, but with technology, it's it's sometimes it's good to play the long game. Do you think, as a reviewer, that eventually you'll get yourself a PlayStation Four too? Uh, I wouldn't turn one down. I mean, if someone's handing them out at the grocery store, it's like, hey, dude, you want a PlayStation Four? Be like, oh yeah, man, why not? Um, <laughs> but at the same time, how many people have two consoles? It's it, it would be strictly for review purposes. Uh, but I think right now I'm like most people where you buy into one or you buy into the other. And well, you, you are heavily invested in the Xbox technology because you've had a 360 and you've, you've had, you've actually had Xboxes from the very first one. And, uh, and, and so you have all the games, you have all the investment in, in, in the, in the, the different software, um, for you to have gone out and got a PlayStation four, you would have had to start virtually literally start all over again. Would you have not? Yes. Okay. Well, no, not not really, because I'm uh, I, I have a an Xbox Gold, which is of course the, the membership, and I've had that for a while. But there's not really a lot of takeover from one to the other. I have a small friends list, and unfortunately, actually, I, I won't say small. Back back in the day, you could only have a hundred friends, and you had actually had to kick people off as you went from game to game. And I have a hundred friends on my friends list. I got to say, there's only about three people out of the hundred that are actually still active on 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 that particular account again that's not saying that all of them have stopped playing xbox altogether people go off and start new accounts all the time um you know they it's been you know about 10 years since i made that account so it's not surprising that a lot of people have dropped off but to to quote unquote start all over again isn't really a big deal okay yeah okay well um so now you have the Xbox and you're and and you have Windows 10 and now you're just waiting for the uh, the melding of the two and you're they're saying sometime during the holiday time that it's going to happen around Christmas. They say in the next couple of months the Xbox One will be getting a massive system overhaul because right now it's very reminiscent of of uh, of Windows 8.1 and the whole Metro style, you know, all the squares and the blocks and the live tiles, all that kind of thing. Very very reminiscent and I hear in the next couple months that Windows 10 will be able to start streaming games from the Xbox One. You'll be able to use your controller and play uh, the and be able to play Xbox games on your computer, and vice versa. 
you'll be able to stream applications to your Xbox from your computer and you'll be able to plug in a keyboard via USB into your Xbox One and be able to use your Xbox One as kind of a terminal. So they gave the example of, of Microsoft Office, obviously, but this could go for any, any application that you're running on your computer. You can then port over and, you know, of course, mouse and keyboard obviously are going to be compatible with the Xbox One at that point. You can then use that app on the Xbox One. So be this a, a PC exclusive game, you could then have ported over to your Xbox One or an Xbox One game that is exclusive, have that ported over your, to your PC. There's a, it's going to be good. And they said that's coming in the next couple months. So I'm, I'm betting by holiday, they want to have a lot of nice, shiny new features in hopes of getting people to buy. And those would be really nice features to have. Yeah. To, to entice people, to entice yeah. people. No, it, it, it yeah. makes a lot of sense. So um, uh, I think you're in the right place and, uh, and the right time. And, and as a media person yourself, of, uh, especially with the gaming uh, expertise that you have, um, by the way, I have to say, when I was watching Ben uh, uh, firing up the Xbox One for the first time, uh, talk about fingers flying over the keys. He, he was putting in passwords. He, he was setting it up. You, you took so little time to do that. You know, you had it done, added it, set it, added it in. Uh, not only that was a testament it, also. They're, 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 they didn't redo the entire interface. Inter like, it's not like, oh, Xbox One with new mind-melding capabilities, and you have to put this controller over your head, mm -hmm. and you have to think your way through the menus. Ah. No, it's still a basic console with the controller, joysticks, A, B, X, Y. It's still, you know, going to be the same. So if, if you've ever used an Xbox original, an Xbox 360, and now an Xbox One, the control scheme never really changes. But what about the control gate unit itself? I mean, I felt that it had a nice heft to it. Uh, is it all the buttons and everything in the same position, or they did they did they move anything? If you're uh, watching the video, actually, let's switch on over. I actually have that right here. Ah, okay. It's uh, yeah, no, and it feels weird to be doing a review of the Xbox and the or the Xbox One in the controller. You know what? Three years after its debut, but yeah, no, it's uh. It's nice. It's nice, sleek, thin. Doesn't have that big bulky rumble pack or battery packs, you know, sitting out the back anymore. Uh, it's very comfortable to the hands. They they did their research this time around when making it, when making a, a controller. It definitely I, feels better than the Xbox 360. Okay, so that controller they did make improvements. They, uh, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, all right, well good. All right, um, but they didn't do anything radical. Like they didn't go with the PlayStation 4 style and add, you know. Uh, two R buttons or a third trigger or anything like that or a third joystick. Mm -hmm. They they kept it simple. They improved the lines. They you know reduced the heft. They luckily kept the AA batteries because you know I think a lot of controllers wanted to go rechargeable, but rechargeable battery technology just isn't there yet. I think a lot of people play games for longer than the battery pack lasted, and that led to a lot of headaches. So well, th does this take advantage of the uh, the new lithium uh, batteries that are now available? Duracell AA nope. make lithium batteries now. So you just the standard does uh, alkaline. Just standard AA's, AA's, which is actually what I prefer. And how, how about how much use do you get with a, a set of AA's now? No idea. Okay. I've been playing it for three days and they haven't died yet, so I'll keep it tuned. Does it does it does it notify you when the batteries are running low on the? Uh... I would assume so. Again, three days hasn't happened yet. Okay. Okay. All right, well, there's the Windows 10 update and then our Xbox One update, uh, courtesy of Ben. And uh, we're now going to continue doing our computer technology news. Brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. And uh, um, I guess this is in the wake of the new Star Wars movie. Star Wars is coming out, what, in December or November, something, I think, the actual movie? Yeah, uh, November, I want to say. November, right, okay. Well, this, according to Ars Technica, Disney is creating two massive, massive Star Wars themed lands at both Disneyland and Disney World. Uh, they're actually they're gonna try to get their money's worth after purchasing those IPs. Yeah, uh, attractions will let you fly the Millennium Falcon and visit the Moss Eisley spaceport. I remember that. Uh, there we go. 
So, and uh, we're looking at some of the, the concept art that's going to be for the, these theme parks. This is going to cost a fortune, obviously, but uh, Disney's ready to uh, uh, put this in. Um, now, obviously, um, uh, this story, again, is from uh, uh, Mark uh, Wa uh, Walton. Yeah, Mark Walton from the UK, Ars Technica. Um, <clears throat> He's saying with the with the uh, the new Star Wars films coming up uh, with the Force Awakens, and that's starting this winter. Uh, the real reason uh, he got excited for Disney's acquisition of Lucasfilm is finally happening, and Disney is building a Star Wars theme park. That time, um, and actually, they're building two Star Wars theme park attractions. Uh, one is as Disneyland, Disneyland in Anaheim, California, which is the first one that was the main one. And also Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida. Uh, it'll take around 14 acres, okay, each. Uh, they'll make up a huge part of each park. And there's no word on when the Star Wars might actually be coming to Disney parks in Europe or Asia, but hopefully it'll be soon. That's that's he that's his sentiment. Now, now he says that the details on it are kind of scarce, uh, but they'll feature new two at least two new rides, each theme park. Uh, we'll let you take control of the Millennium Falcon. That's going another that'll be set inside the wretched hive of scum and villainy that is the Moss Eisley Cantina. Yeah, the the infamous Cantina scene, and I could see that. Mm. I couldn't see that as a ride personally. No, that seems like a weird ride, but I could see that as kind of a. Disney has these great areas that are interactive and you know you, you kind of just go there for the for the atmosphere and the experience and you know the uh, Universal Studios does it really well where they have different themed restaurants you know based on 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 restaurants of movies mm -hmm. and yeah you know, I, I believe one of them is like Clockwork Orange like the whole uh, diner they have there like I, I believe there's a restaurant based around that diner but no um, they could put that in as like a literal cantina, like a literal restaurant and then have like live action performers and that same annoying song going on in the background. So gives me nightmares. Uh, I like the, I like that scene. I mean, I, I remember, you know, again, this is before your time, but I went to the original star Wars when it debuted at the movie theaters. And, uh, uh, and, and I remember seeing that scene. That was my, one of my favorite scenes. Uh, it, it, I had never seen anything like it before, you know, and that's one of the, one of the probably one of the reasons why. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, there's been many other memorable moments in the Star Wars uh, saga, but I still that's probably one of my favorite scenes. Now, according to this article, uh, the attractions that we're talking about at Disney will also introduce an as yet named new planet from the intergalactic film saga. So we're going to keep it up to date. Um, I guess they not only want to keep the uh, you know all the old scenes and all the old settings of you know of course one through three and three and four through six, but they want to do some obvious tie-ins with the new seven through nine because that's the one Disney's making. And if Disney can uh, do something really cool, add in new planets, add in new characters, add in new experiences. Then, and if they can tie that into what they're building today, then that park is going to be very, very relevant, and it may just drive people to say, "Wow, did you see what they did in Episode Eight? I hear Disney has a ride to simulate that fight scene from Episode Eight. We should go check that out." So they want to make it as current as possible, oh. not just a straight one-for-one -one homage to the original four through six. I've just been informed that our telephones are working now. Do you want to try to get the uh, 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 Dis uh, Disney uh, dictionary.com? I can try to get uh, See, it. here's the thing. I don't know what you told her, and she might have, you know, she's, of course, CEO of dictionary.com. She's very busy. I don't know what you told her. Well, I told her that we were having technical issues that we would probably try to reschedule, but if you want to try to get her on the phone while I'm doing this next story, we can do that and see if she's available. And uh, tell her. Right. That's up to you. you. Why don't you try that, okay? In the meantime, uh, Ben and I are doing these uh, computer stories, uh, computer news stories, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to do this next one, um, and uh, that is, um, well, let me see. 
Mozilla, this is from Maximum PC, and again, Paul Lilly. Uh, Mozilla is working towards a real private browsing in Firefox. I wasn't aware that the private browsing wasn't real. Evidently, <laughs> well, you could put it in like incognito mode, or you could put it in private session where it wouldn't put cookies or anything like that on your computer. Yeah. But you could, but your your internet browser, or I'm sorry, not your browser, your uh, oh, what do you call it? Your ISP could still see where you were going. Okay, well, uh, well um, I'm going to continue on with this now. Uh, this is uh, again from Paul. He says all the major browsers come with a private browsing mode of some of uh, um, okay well we can't we can't reach out um, okay um, so, so in other words there there's a so you can uh, shop for birthday gifts and kind of plan surprise parties you know without leaving any trace of what you've been up to because well, that's what you're using private browsing for <laughs> Or more realistically, to to visit seedier sites. <laughs> there we go. There you go. That's it. All the porn sites. You know, you don't want people knowing. Okay. Where are we? We could beat around the bush. We could yeah. speak an innuendo, and we could suppose what you need. But you know, oh, let's call a spade a spade. Yeah, exactly. Whatever the use case scenario, these private browsing modes are mostly designed for local peace of mind. Okay. They they erase your history. And they take other steps to hide where you've been from anyone else who might be using the same computer. Uh, though now Mozilla wants to take things further than that. Okay. So um, they've they've rolled out a few experimental enhancements to its private browser feature. Okay. Um, which are currently available in pre-beta versions of Firefox. Okay. And these include Firefox developer editions on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and Firefox Aurora on Android. Okay. Okay. So these enhancements are designed to actively block website elements that might be recording your activities or otherwise collecting data about your online activities without your knowledge. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The enhanced protection can sometimes come at a cost, especially when sub-websites might appear broken when Firefox blocks elements that track your behavior. You know that 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 that's one of the things. If you if you're going to use private browsing, that means they're turning off your cookies. Uh, they're turning all the things. And some browser, some of the websites won't operate if they can't get access to cookies or or put a cookie on your system. They're going to think something's broken, and they'll actually say, you know, turn your cookies back on. I've seen this happen time and time again. Uh, 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 and they will just usually just refuse outright to to work. Um, yeah, that, that happens sometimes, and it's it's weird to come across. And I really don't trust sites that do that. Mm -hmm. But cookies aren't the like like it's easy to say cookies are the bad guys because they come from companies to track your your whereabouts. But cookies are just a useful tool. Mm -hmm. So you know some websites depend heavily upon them, and they like you to have them. But I don't think any website should require them, you know, as a necessity. And of course, you always have the option of unblocking, you know, um, finicky, you know, elements to view a website normally. It does have that. Now, as to some of the new features, Mozilla's got a new tracking protection mechanism. And when I say tracking protection, it's capital T, capital P. They're calling it, that's the name of it, tracking protection. And uh, that also blocks some websites and domains outright, okay? So, so that, that tracking protection, this is a quote from them, allows you to take control of your privacy online. Uh, while Firefox has a do not track feature that tells websites not to monitor your behavior, and by the way, that's completely optional on, on, the, on the website. They, they may or may not do that. That's a do not track is completely voluntary. It doesn't force them to do anything. Um, companies are not required to honor it. That's what I just said. Now, Firefox... I I believe the the last company, or at least the last big company that fell into the trap of not honoring it was Yahoo. And Yahoo said that they put on some kind of super cookie and they didn't honor the do not track. And again, Yahoo is a big company yep. and they got a lot of flack for that. Yeah. Well, Firefox tracking protection features puts the control back in your hands, the consumer, by actively blocking domains and sites that are known to track users. Okay, this is again from Mozilla, which is nice, I think. 
and uh, so and obviously it's in beta, so you can go and get it, get the the version and try it, you know. But uh, and and the way they've done it is that you can still continue to use your regular Firefox browser because it creates a separate profile, so you can use it. And and if you come to a website where the newer version doesn't work for some reason or crashes, you can always go back to your regular Firefox browser. So that's nice. So you can run it alongside. It, it's not you know one or the other. But uh, that's the story for that. So uh, obviously, their uh, Firefox is still working to, for a real private browsing in Firefox. And I'll, I'm glad. I'm, I like to see that happening. So that's that. Okay, I guess uh, according to Ben, uh, we're not going to be able to get our guest. Uh, there's some still, unfortunately, yes, yeah, still technical issues. And as I said, we will reschedule dictionary.com on another uh, upcoming show. In the meantime, we've got the bottom of the hour. We'll take a little break. We've got a brand new tips bull to review again from Marty Winston um, and some commercial messages. And then we'll continue on with our computer and technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. We will be right back. Don't go anywhere. This is Computer America. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door to door, neighborhood by neighborhood to educate citizens about local resources available for at-risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community-based approach to no kill helps keep family pets healthy happy and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place for more information or to make a tax deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization visit their website at www.bwar.org help to realize brother wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home who's a good boy <laughs> You know it's the best part of the show, right? It's Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. This time, the Waterloo Gas Monkey Garage Tool Chest and Cabinet. Gas Monkey Garage is just one of the licensed brands under which Waterloo Industries manufactures those rolling metal stack of drawer carts that seem to scream mechanic no matter how skilled the owner of the thing or the tools inside may, may be. These tool trolleys come in three levels of construction. Thin metal versions as low price leaders for casual weekend mechanics, super brawny versions for the pros, and a level in between like the one we got for more than casual but less than professional users. The muscle combo we got for review includes a 26 inch wide chest. Its drawers are on ball bearing slides that can handle 75 pounds each. Plus, it has gas struts on the top lid. It all rides atop a rolling 26-inch wide cabinet. The whole thing on 5-inch by 2-inch wheels. It has an overall load rating of 1,000 pounds, half a ton. Ours arrived at a great time, just before we moved, but we should have gone this way years ago. Bottom line, the Gas Monkey Garage 26-inch rolling dual cabinet and chest muscle combo from Waterloo Industries is a formidable chaos antidote on wheels. 
for all the tools most of us are ever likely to have or need. It's Marty Winston with a News Tips Bulletin Review for Computer America. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. Uh, for anyone out there who has not been keeping up to date tonight, or you may just be tuning in, whatever it may be, we actually just got a question. Uh, by the way, you can do that. You go to Computer America over on the left side, enter a question, name, email, question, just so we, uh, and just so we can get back to you. Uh, you know, it's the reason for the first two. But we just had a question about Anonabox and what happened to them. And as Craig mentioned earlier, they had a scheduling conflict. The conflict being, of course, their lawyer said no, and our guest <laughs> said yes. And so the lawyer won in that particular ar well, argument. I don't so blame they'll you. be back eventually. It's just when they get the green light from legal, then they can come on our show and talk about just what Anonabox is. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I'm to that. And the second hour guest, uh, a little bit different deal. Our network is having a few technical snafus. We will have them sorted out by tomorrow night. We promise. Yep. You can always listen to us on our live video feed. But uh, yeah, dictionary.com will be rescheduled hopefully sometimes this week if we can manage it. Uh, but for the first hour, technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. Second hour, technology news brought to you by Slimware Utilities. <laughs> We're just going to do two hours of tech news, which is nice because sometimes we don't get to all the stories that we would like to. And two hours, of course, offers us that opportunity to do just that. So Craig just finished up the uh, the article from Max and PC talking about the new uh, Firefox feature that will allow you to do true private browsing, which yep. before was only possible using a VPN. And if... Mozilla Firefox can get that working. I know a lot of people, and again, these aren't people who the sky is falling, the government's out to get you, and aliens are among us. It, it's just everyday average people that value their privacy and would like to be not tracked. And if Firefox can get that in a browser that's easy to use, just hit one button or hit one keystroke, and you're surfing very anonymously, yeah, I know a lot of people that would flock to that feature just for that feature. Uh, I agree. It's, I, it's it's like the polar opposite of what Google does because Google, if you use the Chrome browser, again, I love the Chrome browser. I use it all the time. I use it across multiple devices. I find the integration it, it provides very, very easy. But if you're on the Chrome browser, you're pretty much guaranteeing that everything you do, every keystroke, everything you type, everything you search, everything you do is being tracked to the nth degree because Google makes their money off of that data, aggregating that data and providing you with ads and blah, 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 blah. You know everything in Chrome, you're being tracked and you just kind of have to weigh that against the, the increased functionality. Mm -hmm. Firefox, I guess, is going the opposite direction where if they can offer you an experience that is truly untracked and, and untraceable, that, you know, that's the flip side of the coin and, and just as many people, I think, are going to go for that. That's it. Okay, so uh, again, uh, um, that and you can run both the uh, beta version and your current version of Firefox at the same time too, which was how this started. Well, yep. Okay, so your turn to pick. My turn to pick. And Samsung, if you didn't catch the very beginning of, of the show, they recently released a 16 terabyte solid state drive. Yeah. But is that enough for the mines over at Samsung? Nope. No. They're offer or they're they're considering this one, and while the idea isn't brand new, I believe Elon Musk and SpaceX had a similar idea, and Google also had a very similar idea, although the, theirs were based on the ground. Samsung, this from Popular Science, uh, wants to put uh, I'm sorry, wants to blanket the Earth in satellite internet. Okay, how's that? So going? yeah, Dave Gershkorn, and yeah, just to uh, well, I, you know, how, how's it going to work? It's Hopefully, it's going to work very, very well. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Da, 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 here it is. Okay. So, Samsung, satellite internet. And this is a very cool idea. So, a paper published by uh, Farouk Khan, president of Samsung Research America in Dallas, uh, details an interconnected net of 4,600. 40, again, 4,600. Okay, that's a big word. 4,600 low-orbit satellites that could bring each of the world's 5 billion people 200 gigabits of internet per month. 
Samsung expects global internet traffic to reach one zettabyte per month. A zettabyte. Yeah, by 2028. So in 2028, the global internet traffic will be one zettabyte. Now that's a, th- a zettabyte is a thousand exabytes is one zettabyte. Uh, and, and so wait, 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 wait. Well, let's, do, let's start with a thousand megabytes is a gig. A thousand gigs is one terabyte. A thousand terabytes is a petabyte. A thousand petabytes is a exact exabyte, an exabyte. Exabyte. And a thousand exabytes is a, uh, one zettabyte. One zettabyte. So that's, let's see, uh, just counting the orders of magnitude, that's somewhere in the neighborhood of a lot. That's a, <laughs> that, that's a ton. As a one zettabyte per month by 2028. So, you know, they have a quote here saying that our goal here is to design a space internet with similar capacity in reference to the one zettabyte figure. That is by Khan. Uh, this also brings Samsung in a race with the likes of Elon Musk and Richard Branson, who are actively working on investing in a similar satellite venture. Uh, the Branson-backed OneWeb offers a similar approach to Samsung, a net of 648 satellites, again, compared to Samsung's 4,600, that orbit and transmit to the ground stations that in turn relay the signal to users. So, and that seems to be the, the key, or at least the key similarity between all of these, where the satellite, like your cell phone or your... Uh, or your laptop or whatever you're using wouldn't directly link up to the satellite. The satellites would be in a position to power or at least provide signal to ground nodes all over the place. And then those ground nodes would then provide your phone with the signal because, you know, the signal going all to one, uh, you know, if all of the internet was going to one node, that one node wouldn't be able to handle it. So you're you're rerouting your traffic through all of these ground nodes all over the country, all over the world, and then that's going up to the massive network that is the satellites. Bing, bang, boom. That's how you handle one zettabyte of traffic a month. Now let, let's put that into, into perspective. We you 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 gave the the correct thing: the one megabyte to gigabyte, a thousand tera, a thousand tera is a peta, a thousand peta is an exact exabyte. Uh, uh, and then a zettabyte is it's uh, one thousand to the seventh power. Okay, which wow, is, which is called a sextillion. That's a short, uh, or it's a thousand trillion. Okay, but there's one that what what do you have when you have a thousand zettabytes? What is that called? Uh, a, a black hole. A yottabyte. <laughs> That's a thousand to the eighth power, or one septillion, or one quadrillion. That's how that that's that's one with uh, twenty four. It's with with uh, three six nine twelve fifteen with twenty four zeros after it. That's how big that is. Crazy, it is crazy. But to have that many zettabytes, what they say, how many zettabytes a month? One, j- j- just one. one. Okay, so one zettabyte a month. That's well, that's, just one zettabyte a month, and then that's twelve zettabytes a year. That's a thousand. A zettabyte is a th- one zettabyte is a thousand trillion. That's what that is. And, and, and again, that number is beyond anything you know. Like that is beyond uh, mm. just envisioning. So, and, and of course, that's by 2028. That is within the next 13 years. Mm-hmm. That's not saying what's going to happen within the next 26 years. What's going to happen in the year, you know, 2041? Well, we'll, we'll get into yada bites. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, seriously, it, it's a. Uh, Technology is going to advance at that rate, and it's you know it's only going to go up. It's not like twenty twenty eight. We're going to hit some magical roof. No, it's just going to keep increasing. You know what's and going to Samsung, happen? They're going to, and they're going to look back at Samsung and say, "Remember when we when we thought sixteen terabytes on a solid state drive was huge?" <laughs> we we do that already. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps too much on the show, mm-hmm. but uh, yeah. So Samsung satellites would transmit what mil, uh, what millimeter waves or uh, these are at 100 gigahertz. Uh, this, re- this frequency would allow for the transmission of terabytes per second. Uh, the total spectrum avail- availability would be 57.75 gigahertz for uplink, 56.2 gigahertz for downlink, and 38.75 gigahertz for intersatellite communication. So obviously these things would be plenty fast enough on their own spectrum. It's not like they'd have to you know, go into the 4G or the 5G 
where cell phones transmit at, these are going to the 100G. Mm -hmm. um, so however, the satellites would orbit much higher than, than other systems have been proposed. Uh, Elon Musk SpaceX would be only at 400 miles above the Earth, whereas Samsung would orbit at 900 miles above the Earth. Mm. Still technically low orbit, but just to give you some perspective, uh, the International Space Station is 250 miles above Earth. Wow. So this would be, you know, a little bit over three times, almost four times uh, further than the International Space Station. This, again, Samsung's uh, satellite uh, array, I guess. Or not array. Um, system? System. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But right now, again, it's just a paper. And it includes a multi-com core system and low latency transmission and maximizing antenna gain, blah, 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 blah. This, this is a paper from the uh, head of research for Samsung. So it's obviously a paper coming from the right person. It's just, are we going to be able to see this uh, tomorrow? No, this is still on paper. And it's, it's quite ambitious to say that they want to provide internet to, it doesn't matter where on earth you are you will have an internet connection. That is, I think... What's that going to do to Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi is still very important because Wi-Fi, like the signal strength, think of it like uh, emergency cell phone service. It may not be what you want to use it for every single day of the week because the signal may be low, may be spotty, may not be constant, like you wouldn't watch Netflix on something like that. But to get you know those those GPS update uh, those GPS coordinates, it, that's plenty. Like it, it's going to be just enough internet for you for your devices to get the information they need, and that is going to change the world yet again. Because no matter where you are, you'll always be connected to someone. You'll you'll you know this is the world that Samsung and uh, Elon Musk and Richard Branson are envisioning. Nowhere will you go on Earth that you are truly alone anymore because you'll always have internet access. There it is. It's comforting. Admittedly, you know, the nearest person might be a thousand miles away, but in general, you know, you, you'll, you'll never be without the ability to order a pizza in three keystrokes. <laughs> no matter where you are. Uh, okay, now this is an interesting story. Again, it's got the gaming theme and Windows 10. This is from Maximum PC, Paul Lilly. He says, Windows 10 may punt you from playing pirated games. Uh, well, that's a scary thought. Yeah. So he asks, have you, have you read through the EULA? That's the end user license agreement for Windows 10. And if not, you might be in for a surprise if Microsoft decides to follow through the terms outlined in Section 7B. Did you read Section 7B? I didn't even go, I, I didn't even make it to Section 7, I'll be honest with you. Which warns that Windows 10 can automatically check for and block access to illegal software, including counterfeit games and unauthorized hardware. And uh, he actually does a reprint, and I think I'm going to read it. This is, it's, this, it says, sometimes you'll need software updates to keep using the services. We may automatically check your version of the software and download software updates or configuration changes, including those that prevent you from accessing the services, playing counterfeit games, or using unauthorized hardware peripheral devices. You may also be required to update the software to continue using the services. Such updates are subject to those these terms unless other terms accompany the updates, in which case those other terms apply. Microsoft isn't obligated to make any updates available, and we don't guarantee that we will support the version of the system for which you license the software. Okay, and it says these terms just don't apply to Windows 10. Nope, they cover other Microsoft services and software such as Skype, Office 365, Xbox Live, and several more like it. See, I'm not even really that concerned about this. Mm -hmm. Because this is nothing new. This is not anything that's going to, you know, change the way gamers play games. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, if, if you were running a pirated version before you logged on to Xbox Live, before you logged on to the game servers, before you logged on to anywhere, 
where a competitive environment, you know, where there's any kind of competitive environment or you synced up with someone else's server, mm -hmm. they were already checking the version of your game and your and your credentials against the information on the server. And if those two don't match up, be it World of Warcraft, be it any game on Xbox Live, be it any game on Steam, be it any game on anything, well, if you connected to it online, it wouldn't let you play it regardless. I, I, you know, it, it doesn't even matter if the operating system isn't let you doing it because you know the the, the game itself wouldn't let you do it. Well, I, I, his concern really isn't the software. You know, he's, he says it's the it's the unauthorized hardware peripheral devices that's kind of wide open. He says that could you know you, you know how, he's, they have these uh, <coughs> third party Xbox One controllers that you can buy. Uh, um, you know, and and evidently, it could refer to those and might not allow you to use them. Um, I can't imagine that happening. I mean, that uh, because any company who makes an Xbox One controller, don't they have get, get some sort of certification from Microsoft to say that it's Xbox One compatible? Um, yes and no, because uh, you can actually make your. Or it, it was actually a pretty common pro practice for you to buy a controller that was aftermarket. Mm -hmm. And it would have things modded. Like there, there was one that you could, like let's say you're playing a shooting game and you have a, sem a semi-automatic, you know, gun. And you know, us normal people, if you wanted to shoot three times, you would squeeze trigger, squeeze trigger, squeeze trigger. There were, there were uh, controllers that you could buy from companies that were not endorsed by Microsoft, and you you wow. could get these controllers. And they were modded so that if you squeeze the trigger, it would, you know, just once it would shoot all three times. It was an aftermarket, not endorsed, not, you know, provided by anything, but they still worked. And they were kind of considered cheating or hacking or, you know, it, it, it was called using a modded controller. And you could actually get banned for doing that. And well, I guess that's the kind of thing they're trying to crack down on. Evidently, you know. Uh, so, uh, so that that's that's and evidently they're 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 cracking down on it even more with the uh, xbox one uh he asked the question what happens if windows 10 detects a perverse peripheral it doesn't want you using okay um we don't know what's going to happen there it could be a pop-up warning it, it could just block it you know in other words the eula that this 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 new eula that microsoft is has, has issued there are a lot of what ifs and uh there's no clarification from Microsoft, uh, at least not for now. Um, hopefully later on there will be. But um, I think I remember that Microsoft want did a re rewrote it because they wanted to write it in quote unquote English rather than legalese, so people could have a better understanding of what it was that they were you know looking at. And I think in that attempt, uh, they may have made it too ambiguous. Yeah. There's one thing about legalese, boy, they can really nail things down. Like uh, Microsoft, I think, really did try this time because here's an excerpt, like, like you know, a word for word excerpt of the terms of service. And that doesn't sound like most of the legalese that we have seen in end nope. user relations agreements. It's actually pretty plain English. Yep. It's, uh, you know, it, it, you don't necessarily need a, a law degree. But I mean, if you were going to try to enforce this in court, then you would definitely need to be a lawyer. But at least you can kind of understand the gist of it. And you know, they they, they try to make it a little bit simpler, but at the same time, you still have to have it cover and protect your company from any of these, you know, from any of these eventualities. So they try to make it too ambiguous because they had to. But you know, it, it's uh, coming at odds with that whole you don't need a law degree to read what you're actually agreeing to. Right, but the point is now they're saying it's it it because they did they did it this way. There there may be some ambiguities in here that need to be fleshed out. And, exactly. Okay. All right. So there you go. So, uh, man, I I hate to say it because I love having guests on, and it would it would have been amazing to have a a box and dictionary dot com on. Yes. But time flew by. Time flew by tonight. Yeah. It's so, it. um. All right, well, let's go with uh, Dr. Dre. Oh, what about the giant marshmallow in front of Google? Okay. <laughs> well, the giant marshmallow in front of Google, 
is, of course, uh, j just to hit that one quickly because we should, the new Android operating system. That makes, you know, that, that's big news because that covers a ton of devices. We still talk about uh, Ice Cream Sunday. We still talk about Kit Kat. We still talk about... Uh, mm -hmm. Jelly bean. Uh, I'm sorry, ice cream sandwich, not Sunday. Ice cream sandwich, jelly bean, you know, all these all these different junk foods. Yeah. And the latest one, uh, Android M, is now actually titled Android Marshmallow and will be the <laughs> next Android operating system. Yeah, so they, that was announced. They got the little Android bot, the little green one, and he's carrying this he looks like the giant marshmallow man. He's got the huge marshmallow he's carrying. So Yep. Or yeah. it could be a regular size marshmallow, and that's just how big the Android, you know. Mm. Mascot is <laughs> could be <laughs> okay. So, um, but this, I, I think one of the last stories we're going to do tonight: Dr. Dre and Apple. Mm -hmm. So, if you didn't hear, uh, Compton, Dr. Dre's new album, his first one in 16 years, mm -hmm. was an Apple exclusive, mm -hmm. and again, it was his first album in 16 years, and they said it paid off because. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Dr. Dre's long-awaited new album, Compton. A soundtrack debuted last week in Apple Music. And by the way, uh, straight out of Compton, the uh, the movie, movie. You know, uh, NWA, yeah, did very very well. It dominated the box office box office this weekend, mm -hmm. and you know the critics loved it. They thought it was a very good adaptation of the, of all the stories, and you know weaved all the stories together. And they, you know, so the critics loved it, the audiences loved it, and I guess even the music goers, or at least the music listeners, liked the soundtrack and liked the, uh, and liked the record by Dr. Dre. So they said in its first week sold nearly 500,000 iTunes downloads. Mm. It was streamed worldwide 25 million times mm. in the first week. Wow. That's a lot. It, and again, there's a big disparity between those two. 25 million times it was streamed versus 500,000 times it was downloaded. Obviously, streamed you know, the big champ, obviously. You could take those two numbers and say that, but still 500,000 iTunes downloads. That's people buying the, the album is, is crazy. So, you know, Drake's latest album was streamed 48 million times and Kendrick Lamar's uh, <laughs> To Pimp a Butterfly um, was streamed 39 million times in their respective weeks earlier this year. So they said that those figures include Spotify, which is 75 million subscribers. And yes, even the biggest of the big, Taylor Swift's 1989, which was only available through Apple Music, went from 5,000 to 2.4 million streams a week, according to the Nielsen data, once it went through. So just to put all those numbers into uh, into perspective, 25 million streams only through iTunes, only through Apple, mm -hmm. as compared to 48 million for uh, Drake and Kendrick Lamar, 39 million. That also includes Spotify, which is a huge chunk of that. So for being an Apple exclusive, it obviously didn't break any records in terms of straight up streaming or straight downloads mm -hmm. because you know it was only on one platform. But for being on a single platform and getting more than half of what some of the other biggest names have gotten, they've shown that Apple has the fan base. Apple has the the users to drive the music industry. Right. Twenty five million and five hundred thousand; those are pretty big numbers for a single platform, where people are talking about, you know, just barely twice those numbers using all platforms, including Spotify, which is a huge, huge, huge service. So, you know, uh, I guess that's, uh, you know, j just just to wrap it up, we, we were all kind of wondering what is Apple doing and if Apple is doing right with the whole Apple Music and, you know, their whole redoing of their music infrastructure. And if Dr. Dre's album has anything to say about it, I would say for being an Apple exclusive, it did very, very well. It did very well. So. I, have a, I have a question. What's uh, Dre's PhD in? Dr. Dre, optometry. He is, a, he is an optometrist. You, you would not want him op, uh, doing surgery on you, but yeah. he is an optometrist. So Okay. It was interesting how he got into this. Yes, yes. Very cool. 
Well, that about wraps up the show. And uh, for once, we really got through most of the news stories that we wanted to do. I think there's only a couple of them that we didn't get to. And uh, uh, again, our, our apologies. Uh, Blog Talk Radio had some, uh, t- our network had some technical difficulties. We couldn't get our, our, uh, our second hour guest, um, dictionary.com, on the program, Elizabeth McMillan, CEO. Uh, but we did speak to her, and she has agreed to uh, reappear on an upcoming show later on. And Anana Box also. Uh, uh, we were going to reschedule. Once they get past their stringent legal team, yeah, <laughs> they'll be on the show. And they are stringent. They are there. They want to make be careful. So, all right, coming up tomorrow night. This is gonna be fun. We're gonna have sous vide on the show. We're talking about their sous vide supreme. This is a device that is cooking with high technology, but with a, a, a technique that's been around for how long has sous vide been around? For many, many uh, sous vide, for many, many years, it's yeah. called a water oven to a lot of people. Yeah, a water oven, but it uses technology, and that's right. We're going to have uh, both of the uh, company's uh, um, uh, founders on it. Dr. Michael Eads and Dr. Mary Dan Eads are going to be on with the uh, with the show. So we look forward to you being with us here tomorrow night, same time, same station. So until tomorrow night, this is Craig Crossman, hoping that your hard disk. Never becomes floppy. We'll see you tomorrow night. Good night, everyone. Can somebody get this thing fixed? Well, it's not saying thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Good for morning. obvious reasons. Problem. But uh, we're still on Google Hangouts. And thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, Ben and I will see you here tomorrow night, same time. So take care. And hopefully everything will be, will be fine. Good night, everybody. Night. Say good night, Ben. I did. <laughs> you're, you're muted. That's what it is. Uh, no, you're no, not I, muted? No. no. No, can't hear you. Oh, well, go figure it out. <laughs>